Good morning. Um, it is a distinct and true pleasure to be here among you, and I am very grateful to the organizers for the kind of invitation. Uh, this has been a, uh, just a celebration of ideas, uh, three wonderful uh, days, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will take a lot from here uh, to continue thinking and to continue being dialogue with uh, CES, with the Revista, and also with Waventura's uh, work. And I want to say a, a few words about Waventura. I have had the great privilege and honor to, to be in a sort of ongoing conversation uh, with him for quite many years, at least more than 12, 14, about 14 years, I don't know. And the, the first thing, I, I was in love with Waventura at first sight. So the first three sentences that he, that I, 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 I listened to him say, I was already, this is a very important thinker, and since then I've been captivated by his thought and, and his ideas, no exception. And uh, what struck me is that he's not just an academic or an intellectual, he's a thinker, profound thinker and a philosopher, in the true decolonizing, decolonial meaning. Not a philosopher understood as someone who loves wisdom, but as uh, someone who engages in the opposition to coloniality and that struggle for the affirmation of forms of love and understanding, philos and sophia, that promote open and embodied human interrelationality. Uh, he's also an extremely generous thinker and interlocutor, and uh, there are, um, I mean, I can give examples after examples. I once uh, invited him to a conference, and he ended up, he was the closer of the conference, and he has been the most amazing closing that anyone could give of it, where he went over every single presenter, summarizing very generously the ideas, giving positive input. It was the most incredible end to a conference. And, uh, and I particularly appreciate from his work the combination of the, of the critical part of his work, his contribution to critique, but also then his contribution to constructive thinking. And in terms of critique, I think in the critique of scientific and legal knowledges, right, going their, 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 uh, the way in which they are eurocentered, dominant, monolithic, colonizing, they call to open them, but not simply to just to open them, but to um, construct, constructively and creatively formulate um, new frameworks, new ideas from the South and from social movements uh, in the South and other, and other areas. Right? Not only talking about, from a distance, our critique, and not only simply gesturing to uh, a still relying only on academic work, trying to put together a, a new conception, but actually from the ground, from the places where they are not supposed to be places of thinking, and yet from there he thinking with people and then contributing to these debates from those dimensions. And those, the combination of that is, is very hard to find, and to find someone who does it with such elegance, care, and sophistication is almost impossible, and yet it's possible, here is the proof, he is with us. So I in this presentation, more than going over Baventura's uh, work, what I want to do is to raise this question towards the 21st century social science as a question, and to hopefully set up the terms uh, for new sets of debates after the 40 years, right? Personal uh, debates, conversations that hopefully could be ongoing. And um, I want to start with reference to the work of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, Aldo Morris has recently written a book entitled The Scholar Denied. And maybe actually if the lights here, we kill them, if it is possible to turn them off, uh, so that there are going to be some diagrams that might be hard to read without, you know, with the illumination that, that I, that I if possible. Um, and I want to put in conversation, to some extent, uh, Waventura's work and his intervention in sociology as a sociologist, 
with um, with the boys, with all the boys, and later on also with Franz Fanon. And uh, according to Alan Morris um, in, in his book, what he tries to do, and I will quote this, he writes, I posit that it was the boys who made the most distinctive contribution to American, U.S. American sociology in the first half of the 20th century, though the Bois's pioneering community studies utilized scientific methodology two decades before Robert E. Park and his students, this distinctive contribution has nevertheless been attributed to the Chicago School. Moreover, I will provide that Park knew about the Bois's pioneering, thank you, pioneering studies but failed to accord them the scholarly credit they merited. Even worse, by ignoring Du Bois's groundbreaking scientific work, the Chicago School, mainstream sociology, and social science generally were impoverished theoretically and methodologically for a century. And this is especially true regarding the study of race. So I want to bring to Altura sociology in connection with the voice of sociology um, in the effort of trying to see if we can formulate the sociology of the 21st century for the 41st <coughs> century, if we want to call it a social science or a sociology also, it will be uh, raised as a question. And so from the voice, what I want to I want to highlight a few a few themes. First one, be particularly two main themes. This is one, the theme of the Coraline, which of course I think is directly in dialogue with the notion of the abyssal lines that Waventura writes about and that many speakers have referred to. And this is how the voice puts it in 1903. The original formulation was previously a few years before it came out in this book that he wrote in 1903. And he wrote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea. And um, I think that this, uh, the voices formulation, not only is a major antecedent of the conceptualization of power, knowledge, and the law, in terms of what Guaventura has referred to as abyssal lines, but also that it points to at least two contributions, two potential contributions to Guaventura's reflections. One is how, uh, uh, one con in, in the area of how to approach race and racism, and second, in the area of attention not only to power, structures, epistemic injustice, and social movements, but also to the psyche or philosophical psychology, generally speaking. That has to do with the second quote mainly, but. I think it's in Du Bois's uh, conception, he's already having it in mind here. I will explain this more further. First, I should also say that Du Bois's conception of the problem of the 20th century as, as being the problem of the color line is often made to appear uh, as if he's only referring to the relationships between the relations between whites and blacks in the US. And of course, this quote shows that this is. Uh, clearly not the case, he's looking at the planet, he's looking at the globe, global, uh, international, geopolitical relations. Second, if there is something connecting Du Bois' asser uh, assertion uh, to a particular situation in the U.S. specifically, I would warn us about concluding that he was just being a provincial thinker. Um, for Du Bois, the U.S was, I think, remains an extraordinary laboratory for the sociologist. While sociology emerged in Europe as a response to the accelerated changes brought about by the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, the formation of a society as a differentiated sphere that required its own study in moments, you know, in moments of change, of rapid change, Du Bois saw the U.S as a site of a different sort of a very accelerated changes. Nation building from 1776 to the present. Right? In the US, modernization was not only a project of putting tradition in its place, putting religion in its place, but it was also one of keeping certain sectors of the population, of the population in place, or wiping them out. Of course, the situation in Europe, they had the colonies in the US, 
that, that is occurring within the national space itself. Right? That's an important difference, and yet it is very much related. It's part of the same project. And so I want to call attention to the fact that uh, the boy thought carefully about that. This is a paper from 1898 that he published in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and it's entitled The Study of Negro Problems, and uh, about the U.S., Du Bois wrote in this essay of 1898, here is a field for the sociologist, a field rich but little worked and full of great possibilities. European scholars envy our opportunities, and it must be said to our credit that great interest in the observation of social phenomena has been aroused in the last decade. In one field, however, and a field perhaps larger than any other single domain of social phenomena, there does not seem to have been awakened as yet a fitting realization of the opportunities for scientific inquiry. This is the group of social phenomena arising from the presence in this land of 8 million persons of African descent. It is my purpose in this paper to discuss certain considerations concerning the study of the social problems affecting American Negroes. And in the, uh, the paper, he studied the, the, the elements that he brings up in relation to the study, you know, this, what kind of study and what kind of sociological approach we need to have in order to study this community, right, in this particular situation, and through that, potentially renewing Today, perhaps we would say decolonizing sociology. And so, Du Bois in this paper, he offers a number of suggestions, methodological suggestions and ideas. Uh, he talks about the need for careful systematic study, the scope, uh, he writes about the scope and the method of future scientific inquiry, and he even points to the importance of thinking about, quote, the agencies by which this work can be best carried out. And there, by the agencies, is, for example, the university as an institution. And this is 1898, and he's already thinking about that in order to produce new knowledges, we need to also uh, produce a new kind of institution. We need to transform the institution of the university. So the voice appears relevant even to the task of decolonizing the university, which has been a major kind of um, set of uh, issues in South Africa, England, and so many other parts. So, There is an, an, an element that uh, I want to point out uh, in addition to this, you know, this specific character of, of, of the U.S. as, as this kind of, of laboratory that provides an opportunity to produce new knowledge about modern Western societies, but also to expand, to change, to transform the sciences. Um, that study that, that context. <coughs> and it is the fact that, it, it has to do with the fact that, that Du Bois's reflection on the color line, um, they are published in this book that is entitled The Souls of Black Folk. Right? And The Souls of Black Folk, he's thinking about particularly the souls of black people in the US, right? So we're still talking about that laboratory. Or it's a laboratory for social analysis, but in this case for some soul analysis as well. And for him, the two were not disconnected. So I want to, to highlight here the connection between the formation and legitimization of the social world and the production of subjectivity or the soul. And. Uh, Du Bois, actually, he had a, a, a relationship with uh, Max Weber uh, uh, in Berlin, and, and he was a, um, and Du Bois was a sociologist, right? and he went to Berlin, so with Max Weber, there are, uh, uh, Aldo Morris um, elaborates on the fact that this was not simply Du Bois being the student of Max Weber, but that there was actually, there were many points in which they both learned from each other. 
uh, Morris documents this, the contributions of Du Bois to even Max Weber sociology, not to talk about US American sociology. But Du Bois also, he studied psychology and philosophy. So before he went to Berlin, he was at Harvard University and he studied with uh, William James, who was one of the founders of the first department of psychology at Harvard and himself. He's been, he said to have taught the first psychology class in the US. And he was also a philosopher. So I think Du Bois was actually coming, it's a kind of sociology that is combined with philosophy and that is combined with psychology. Therefore, he's talking about these global color lines and in the same text he's talking about these souls. So I want to examine uh, what he says about these souls. He writes, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and the Mongolian, the Negro, is a sort of seventh song born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused content and pity. And I want to highlight in here the notion of there being no true self-consciousness, and also the notion of measuring one's own, soul, one's own soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Uh, because this is a unique kind of psychological makeup as a result of the color line on this embodied subject who is the Negro. And see that here, uh, the point of the, the the, 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 this combination of points, I think, is, is, is very important. The point is not only that for the quote-unquote Negro, the black person in the U.S., you are put in a social condition that self-awareness, self-consciousness, therefore making decisions from your own, projecting yourself to the future, that is extremely difficult. <laughs> but then that's not only the problem. The problem is that you are in your own soul. You are measuring your soul on the measure of another point of view that looks at you with contempt and pity. And that makes the soul, your soul, to be at war with yourself all the time, because you are always measuring yourself in relation to a standard that you are never going to be able to satisfy. So what this creates is a subject modality that is at war with itself, at war with its body, at war with other people that look like you because you are using the standards that are from the outside of white supremacy. And so this is, a, this is a, a very peculiar condition that if you have it then it's clear, if you can produce subjects, not only that they cannot attain self-awareness, full self-awareness, they cannot become fully agents, but also that whatever agency they have, they are they, they invested in going against themselves. If you have that kind of Sub, sub, subjects in society, then... Sorry, Nelson, can yes. I ask you to speak a little slower so slow. the translators can follow? Okay, thank you. Um, that what happens when you have a Puerto Rican talking English. Also. <laughs> speak very fast from the Caribbean. Um, so, the, <coughs> if you produce these subjects who are at <coughs> war against, against themselves, then you basically you have won the war. I mean, whiteness has, has won the war, right? You have you have the uh, most powerful weapon in your hands, and this is precisely what Steve Biko uh, brought about. You know, when he proposed that the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And Biko, as you know, black South African, he's also thinking about that, this similar condition that Du Bois was pointing out at uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century. If the mind of the oppressed yields no true self-consciousness, and in addition to that, to not be fully aware of who you are, you are also in war with yourself, then you become your worst enemy. But not only that, the colonized subjectivity engages in a war against the bodies and against each other while affirming the standard values. Therefore, it is indeed the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressed. Now, I think that Du Bois's point was uh, also that the social phenomena that he was studying could not be separated from the psychological phenomena and the study of consciousness. 
including the consciousness of the knowledge producer, of the scientist herself and himself. The sociologist has to do philosophy and psychology at the same time. In order to deepen this point, I will now turn to another black intellectual who took these three areas as central, philosophy, psychology, and sociology, Frank Fanon. While Du Bois was a sociologist who took psychological issues seriously, Fanon was a psychiatrist who took sociological issues equally seriously. Du Bois, uh, both of them were also philosophers. Du Bois sort of influenced, uh, oriented by pragmatism to some extent, US pragmatism, and Fanon in conversation with existential phenomenology and Marxism and other areas. Now, by focusing on this relationship between sociology, psychology, and philosophy, I will provide a new reading of a difficult passage in Fanon's work, that which alludes to the son of, of non being. And here I am already anticipating the idea that if there is going to be a social science for the 21st century, it needs to catch up with these interventions of the early 20th century and mid 20th century of these black intellectuals. Uh, points of views that they developed because they were paying close, serious attention to what it meant to be black in the modern world. And so the passage from Fanon that I want to highlight is this. There is a son of non-being, an extraordinarily sterile and arid region, an inclined strip bare of every essential from which a genuine departure can emerge in most cases, the black man cannot take advantage of this descent into a veritable hell. So notice here that while it describes the son of non being as a sterile, it also identifies it as the place where a genuine departure can emerge. It also indicates that black subjects in most cases cannot take advantage of this descent into the son of non being which is characterized as a veritable hell. What I'm going here is that I think that we can decode this passage if we bring together philosophy, psychology, and sociology. The positive references to the son of non-being indicate that it cannot mean the colonial social world. To start with, it seems that whites are the ones who take advantage of the descent into this hell. But why? might this help be? Here I think that it's relevant to know that Black Skin White Masks is a text where Fanon is in dialogue with three figures, Freud, Césaire, and Jean-Paul Sartre. In Sartrean existentialism, absolute freedom is a sort of hell. Sartre wrote, man is condemned to be free. But also something like a sterile and arid region. Sartre called it nothingness. That was freedom, about uh, an experience of, of subjectivity, uh, and the experience of oneself as absolutely free can lead to authenticity. If we interpret this passage with Sartre in mind, then what Fanon is saying is that in most cases, black subjects do not go through the experience of freedom that can lead to authenticity. Now, what would that be? Here, the boys help us. Black subjectivity takes form as double consciousness, where no true self-consciousness is possible, as we saw before. And no true self-consciousness is possible because black consciousness is socialized into being obsessed with measuring itself from the point of view of another group that is taking them. Fanon would say that the black man's soul is a white man's artifact, and it is haunted by whiteness. Fanon is talking then about the lived experience that is different from experiencing oneself as totally free or as totally determined. It is rather a subjective experience that is of a subject who is at war against herself, against themselves, against their blackness, in themselves and in others constantly. Which is why the first two chapters in Black Skin, why masks are our blacks who betray themselves and others in their wishes to appear white or getting access to whiteness. 
This situation is neither one that characterizes the zone of being or the zone of non-being, but I think exists below these two zones. Here are a couple of illustrations of what it means to live below the zones of being and non-being. This is a this is a, a, a work of art. I have the I had the, the name of the author here and escaping. Uh, I'll be provided at the end. It was supposed to be in that blank there. And uh, this is in the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo. It is uh, right now. Right? And it is it is entitled Amnesia. Amnesia. And this is from a former uh, student of mine at Columbia University. And I asked the students to do artistic, creative representations of things that we read. And this was her um, project on, on Fanon Blasky White Masks. Let me see if it runs. That is the song below the song of being and being. But you are stuck there. So it's a lift condition it has to do with the soul, the effects of the soul on the soul of this environment. And so in principle, it could be in positions of extreme poverty, but in principle also it could be a middle class black, or it could be a, even an upper class black. Right? So in that sense, it is so independent that, that the economic position of this subject. Now this is getting closer. Um, and what Fanon proposes is not simply that being in this position, um, then there is no true self-consciousness and no authenticity, but that the routes for black subjects will have of some kind of self-affirmation, some kind of agency, will, have, will go through different channels. And Fanon, right after the lines about the, uh, the impossibility of the black of getting authenticity, he writes, man is not only the potential for self-consciousness or negation. So what he said, it's true that most black cannot attain this level of self-awareness, self-consciousness, like the voice pointed, but he then is saying, but, he, but that's only part of the story, part of the dimension of, of the way in which consciousness works. If it be true that consciousness is transcendental, we must also realize that this transcendence is obsessed with the issue of love and understanding. Man is a yes resonating from cosmic harmonies. And it would be by virtue of the, what he called in chapter 5 of the book, la constance de mon amour, the constance of my love, that the subject, the black subject, is able to escape the position of, of complete inauthenticity and no self consciousness. Of course, the path not being anymore simply attaining self consciousness and authenticity but attaining radical social transformation, which is a precondition for your subjective transformation also. So the, need, the point is that the black does not need to aspire to go to the hell of feeling himself or herself condemned to be free in order to become authentic. While this experience seems blocked by the negative effects of double consciousness, the obsession with love and understanding, which is also an obsession for an intersubjective social world, can lead the black subject to oppose the master. The goal is not authenticity, but decolonization. The point is that cosmic harmonies, citing Fanon, still resonate in the black, even in the absence of that self-awareness, which is what leads later uh, on in the text for Fanon to reject Sartre's arguments about the dialectic and to write that Sartre forgot the constants of his love. My main points, and I know that the time is, is getting over, I'm just going to see uh, if I am allowed a couple of minutes. My main points are that we won't be able to understand the problems of modernity without understanding the gravity of the color line and its impact on subjects and societies. We won't understand fully liberalism, a liberalism that has been profoundly anti-black and that I think we can see as a low-intensity fascism or how to combat social fascism without understanding the gravities of, you know, the, the, how the, the system is able to provoke this, this specific kind of condition of a subject that is at war against herself and himself. Without this, 
Uh, a key question is how the black emerges as a thinker, then as an artist, as, a, and as an agent of social change from this condition that we saw, from taking the mask all the time. This is to, uh, uh, and how to work with others to change society. This is to explore the link between subjective transformation, knowledge and artistic production, and social change. Without this, we will keep glossing over the surface of modern colonial power. We need to think about absences and emergences with Guaventura also from the points where insurgency is impossible because of the color line and its multiple dimensions and aftermaths but from places where, nonetheless, as if by a miracle, as if by the constance of a move and understanding, uh, insurgency still happens. I am simply going to show you a few slides without commenting, which is the last part of how then I have, building from Du Bois and building from Fanon, aim then to, you know, looking at the position of the black subject as this particular subjectivity, try to understand the sphere of power, knowledge, and being, try to understand coloniality from, from the position of the Le Daniel de la Terre, right? the, the condemned, the condemned subjects. Uh, I won't be able to explain it, but I, I will just show you the, the, some of the ideas and the diagrams. And there is a version of this in English, of the developed version of this part online, and recently it just came out a short summary of it in Portuguese in this book that just came out that Ramon Grosfogel, Joaquim Bernardino Costa, and myself edited, The Colonialidad del Pensamiento Afro Diasporico. Uh, Nima Dino Gomez also has a contribution there, and a number of, of, of Afro Brazilian intellectuals. And so, this is what I'm going with, with, with this, using this as a base, to theorize other aspects of domination and coloniality. This is what it is, mean, the subjectivity part is where this damned soul is, and it, a soul that is pinched by power, knowledge, and being, and that's how it is made to be at war against itself. This is how it came out in the, in, the, in the book, in Portuguese. And this is the diagram of the, the insurgency, the coloniality, with the, the name at the center, thinking from this position, uh, through highlighting the elements of love and rage, which is the yes and the no that Fanon highlights. And by virtue of that, Makes, you know, that makes possible an insurgency that I'm trying to theorize in terms of the production of spaces for you know, questioning and arguing for new forms of knowledge and new disciplines, new and, and forms of knowledge that are undisciplined, forms of artistic work and spirituality, social movements, and also border zones between uh, established institutions and decolonial activity so that those institutions, including the university and including the state, can be uh, challenged and challenged in the direction that they open more possibilities for the colonial activity and hopefully they can lead to the formation of new institutions. Um, so I leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>